Okay, they're closing the doors, so I think that's my prompt to begin. Hi, thanks for coming. Have you all had a wonderful lunch and are you all feeling kind of warm and sleepy now in this room with no natural daylight? <laughs> um, the talk is made up of a few different sections. I'm not at all offended if you nod off, but please try not to snore. It puts off the people around you. Okay, so hi, my name's Lorna. I'm a developer advocate for IBM, uh, working mostly with their cloud database uh, systems. That's not really my background. I'm a PHP developer. I just have a new job now. So I am delighted to have managed to join those things up and find a reason to come to DrupalCon and to talk to all of you. So why have I chosen to speak about HTTP today? HTTP wires the web together. Um, it's a lot of the time we don't think deeply about it. We can go a long way without knowing an enormous amount about the theory. But it is very important. And I think as we move more to um, making modular systems that talk to each other, as we move more to using Drupal perhaps as an API backend and serving that content out to some other thing that isn't a front end of Drupal, it's increasingly important that we really understand HTTP. And this will help us to choose and design solutions um, as the expert craftspeople that we are, but also to understand what, what's going on when things go wrong, debug systems more effectively, basically get stuff done. So that's my aim, is to give you some things that you can use to get stuff done. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit of HTTP theory to kick off with, probably familiar to some people, maybe not to others. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the tools that I use when I work with HTTP. Uh, I'm also going to cover OAuth because I think it's a nice sort of showpiece of what you can do with HTTP. I also think it's quite a common use case, so it's likely that it's something that you'll come up against. So. The first thing I want to tell you about HTTP is HTTP is an envelope format. Think of an envelope that arrives through the post. There's information on the outside as well as information on the inside. On the outside, there's the address, the postmark, a stamp, maybe a return address, maybe do not open until your birthday. Some other information might go on the outside. And on the inside is the letter, the birthday card, hopefully with a check in it that you were hoping for. HTTP is really like that. The stuff we see in the browser is what's on the inside, <laughs> but the, all the headers and the metadata is the stuff that's on the outside. That means that we can transmit this data safely from one place to another, and also that we know how to understand it when it gets there. I'd like to show you some examples of requests and responses. So this is a straightforward HTTP request. I've pointed it at my own blog, LaunaJane.net, so that I don't incriminate anyone else. <laughs> uh, look at the first line. It's a get request to slash. Look at the second line. We're making that request to LaunaJane.net. Look at the third line. This is curl. And look at the fourth line. Accept star slash star. Curl thinks it understands every possible content type on the planet. Diplomatically, I'm going to say Curl's an optimist. And Curl is lying. The response headers that come back from that request look like this. I've got a 200 OK. This is good. I have a list of status codes for you in a moment. Uh, there's a date, um, so you can tell how long ago I wrote this in order to do a dry run with my local user group. Um, a content type. My website serves as text HTML. There's some cookie stuff here, cache control, references to other links, uh, more caching header and an expires header. So that's the HTTP response. We don't see this stuff. When you make a request to LaunaJane.net, you get like a picture of an angel and some blurb where I probably wrote about myself in the third person and then some blog underneath that. But the headers that come back look like this and they give us all the information that we need to understand the body payload that was returned. <coughs> This was a straightforward GET request, um, and we can use lots of different types of verbs. Verbs, 
When you're at school, you learn they are a doing word. They indicate which action is taking place, right? Uh, sometimes the things we learn in school don't seem very useful, but this one is quite transferable because it applies to HTTP as well. Um, it's a doing word. So when we do a GET request, we literally fetch it. That's safe. You can repeat it as many times as you like, and you should always get something back. A POST request, we would normally send some data along with uh, the request. So the request will have the headers that you've just seen, and we'll probably send a body as well, and the response will come back, and it will probably have a body as well. The big difference between GET and POST, we can use either of them when we're filling in forms or um, sending requests by other means. The GET request, you see the query parameters on the URL. This is intentional. You use get when you should be able to bookmark it. You should be able to safely repeat this request. This is why we see um, the get parameters used when it's a search result. So you fill in a complicated search form. You might want to bookmark that or share the link with someone. It's always safe to repeat the search. A classic example of post might be a reg user registration form. Once I've registered you, I don't want you to do that again. We send it as post. It's not safe to repeat that. And that's why your browser always asks you, are you sure, when you try and re repeat a post request? Because typically, that's not what it's intended for. So you can make a decision about how you submit your forms. Working with APIs, exactly the same thing as applies. We use get to fetch data. We use post usually to create data. I've got delete here. Guess what that does? Um, <laughs> we, so I could explain it to you clearly and slowly, and I, then you really will go to sleep. Uh, we've got put. We normally use put to update data. So you would do get, look what you got, change it, and then put, do a put back to do an update. There's also patch, which we use in APIs um, for updating. And in that case, you would just supply the piece that you want to change. GitHub has an example of this. Um, it uses patch rather than put. The specs are finalized in patch, but it's live and well on the internet. There are various different types of headers. There are request headers. You've seen the host header, the accept header. There are response headers. Come back and tell you about um, the metadata that belongs with the response. So we might have an e-tag, which is gives like a hash of the content, which we can use for caching to know if something's changed. You might get a location header, which would then cause your client to redirect in most cases. We also get entity headers. These can be included with either request or response. It's with anything that has a body. So if we're posting data, there'll be a content type in the request because there's a body in the request. And when it comes back in the response, we'll have content type there as well. So Request headers, response headers, and entity headers, meaning headers that belong with some kind of body or payload. When we get a response, we get status codes. So we'll always get some kind of headline news. It's like the pass or fail, red or green response. And then you can burrow on down into the body and understand a bit more about what happened. I've tried to include some of the most common ones on the next couple of slides, things that I think you're likely to see. So 200 OK is all good. You'll also see a couple of other statuses that start with a 2. They are also good news, but they're more specific than just a yes. The 201 indicates that a record is created. And sometimes you'll get 204, which means the request that you sent has been successful but I don't have anything to send back. So for example, if I send a, an HTTP request with a delete verb, the record gets successfully deleted. Good. But what are you going to send back to me? Not the record. It's not there anymore. <laughs> there's, there's, like, there's no information to return. The 204 is helpful because it means that we don't need to check the body. We're just like, yep, good. You commonly see 302 found. I think Drupal outputs this. Like, I don't do any Drupal, so don't ask me any Drupal questions. I think Drupal outputs this is normally because it's a result of a rewrite. So, yes, I found the content. 
there was, I followed some rewrites to get there. Um, so 302 is as good as a 200. Uh, but a lot of frameworks will return a 302 because technically they should. Uh, and sometimes you get 302. 307, which is moved temporarily. You can do this if for some reason you have, it's usually in the middle of site migration, you have URLs which are temporarily pointed to a different endpoint, but that's not going to be their eventual home. Use the 307 and the search engines won't update their references. They'll keep using the original URL. So this is going to be quite helpful if you're in the middle of a migration. For status codes where things are not going so well, um, these are the ones that start with a 4 or start with a 5. Um, if they start with a 4, it's the user's fault. And if they start with a 5, it's the server's fault. Okay, like my fault, your fault. That's how it works. The 400 is just an umbrella bad request. You see it a lot in um, APIs, and there'll be more information in the body. Um, f I've put 401 and 403 here. They sound quite similar, but they're crucially not. Right, so let me give you this tip. 401 means unauthorized. I don't know who you are. Please identify yourself. And that's where you'll often get, like if it's a basic auth, you'll get that unbranded pop-up and you need to supply some credentials. 403 forbidden. I know exactly who you are and you cannot come in, right? So 403, I am confident that you do not have access. And 401 is we need to verify who you are before you can have access. So they, there's two sort of auth-related errors, but they genuinely mean different things. I'm guessing you're familiar with 404 not found. Um, a request is made to the server for a resource which is not found. Um, 500, server error. This is a bit of an umbrella term as well. Um, and a lot of the time, we pass a request to Apache. Apache hands it off to PHP. PHP drops off a cliff. <laughs> Apache kind of comes back to us going, ooh. <laughs> so a 500 is, is not a very descriptive error. We see it because often... Um, the thing responding to us doesn't have any more information than this. So PHP can have seg faulted or something else catastrophic has happened, which has meant that it, there's nothing, it doesn't have any more information to tell us. Um, so that happens. <coughs> something else that we see, which I think is important to understand, um, is cookies and sessions. So we don't often work with cookies. You can, you probably will at times. But in PHP, we typically work extensively with sessions. Um, and what that means is, rather than putting information in a cookie and storing it on the user's browser, we store it on the server. Every time a new user visits our website, not when they log in, just when they arrive, we generate a new unique identifier, it's called the session ID, and we send it to them in a cookie. And by convention, their browser will always send back that same cookie with that same session ID in it. And we use it to identify them. We keep a store on the server. By default, PHP writes to files, um, which is fine if you're on one web server. Um, once you outgrow that, put it in Redis. It performs really well. Um, and we write information related to this user or this user's session into local storage on the server. So the user can't see this, they can't tinker with it, um, but we can do it. It works using the cookie. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example of how to fiddle your cookies in a minute. So, one thing we can do with headers is negotiate content types. So for applications that can speak more than just um, HTML, then we can do content negotiation. So we send an accept header, which says, I would like this, and I accept the following formats. Like, I only speak JSON. Then the server should look at what the accept header choices were, wh which formats it supports, and then try and work out some good, <laughs> some good combination of those two, try and send you back something that you can understand. So this is the accept header that my browser is sending by default. I'm using Chrome. Imagine that this is split on commas, so it's comma separated. Some of those values also have a semicolon and a Q value. The Q is how preferred things are. So anything which doesn't have a Q value is Q equals one, like I really want this one, and the others are less preferred. 
So I want to just show you this in action. I'm not crazy enough to demo live, so it comes, in, comes to you in screenshot form, screenshot screencast form. Okay, press this button, this button. I have a new operating system, and it's not totally on my side. So what you are looking at here is, I'm not sure if you can read the fonts, but hopefully you can at least tell the difference between rendered HTML and JSON, which will happen in a minute. Um, what you're looking at here is um, the output of my local development platform for joined in. So api.join.in would be the live version. It's the root of an API. It's a list of hyperlinks. This API speaks both HTML and JSON. I'm using Chrome. So first of all, we use the developer tools, and I want to just show you around my Chrome developer tools. If you're not a Chrome user, don't worry. Uh, Safari, Firefox, Internet Explorer all have the same sorts of things. I just happen to be a Chrome user, and I like it. When I refresh this page, I get a list in the network tab. I get a list of all of the uh, web requests that were made and some information about them. The bottom three quarters are my Chrome plugins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the top one is the API request I actually made, and the second one is the fav icon. So there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on in here. We're really only interested in the top one. Um, you can't read the font, but it says it here, api.dev.join.in. The response status was 200. Uh, it's a document, and it tells you where it came from and how long it took, and you get like a waterfall diagram. This can be really interesting, because if you've got a PC or website that didn't load... You'll see the Ajax call here, or you'll see the asset that was supposed to load and didn't, and you'll see the 404, or you'll see that something happened. You can also click on it in the left-hand column and get a bit more information about it. So when you click on this, you can see the, the request headers and the response headers and everything that was sent. You can also click on the response tab and see everything that came back. So sometimes you'll get some JSON which your client-side JavaScript can't pass. And when you, if you come and inspect, it looks like a 200 OK, there's no problem, but it's just fundamentally not working. Maybe you're seeing errors in your JavaScript console. Come here, and in the response, you may find an HTML error message page where your JavaScript or JSON, well formatted JSON should be. And your client side JavaScript just won't be able to de JSON it because it's invalid. That happens a lot. Here you can see that request header that I mentioned earlier. I'm sending text HTML. Another thing that you can do here, which I think is really valuable, is copy as curl. What request did this make? How can I replicate it? Copy as curl. Curl is a command line tool that makes web requests. Click the copy as curl. Paste it at the command line. This, you, I'm really happy that you can't read it. It's, a, it's really a horrendous mess, but it does perfectly replicate the request that was made. All the headers, all the compression headers, the cookie, everything. This is a perfect repeat of the request that maybe you had a problem with. And you can come here and see, like, oh, what happens if I don't send the cookie? Oh, what happens if I change this? Change my, my user agent. Change my accept header. So you can, you can play with it here. This is a really nice quick start for, I'm going to paste this into curl, and now I'm going to debug it. <coughs> I make the request, and hopefully you can sort of see there's a bit of CSS and a bit of HTML. That's all that happens there. Back in my browser, I'm going to ask for application JSON. This plugin, it's a little blue circle with like an uh, Apple command button symbol in it, is called Mod Header. It allows me to override the headers that my browser would ordinarily send. So I'm just going to send application JSON from my browser. When I make the request, I'm just going to refresh the page. Suddenly, I get JSON back. And again, I can inspect through my headers. You can see that's the accept header I sent, application JSON. Um, and using those tools, I can just switch it. So that's content negotiation, changing my accept header. Because I'm showing you some Chrome stuff, 
going to show you some other Chrome stuff while I'm on it. This is the web front end, again, still on my dev platform. So I've got auto-generated nonsense data. <laughs> Everyone should have hilarious sample data generators in their project. It's the most fun ever. Um, so again, this is my local copy. All I'm going to do here is log in with the standard kind of stock password. Her password is password. We log in. You can see I'm logged in. Her name appears. This plugin is called Edit This Cookie. Again, ex equivalents exist for all the other browsers. Edit This Cookie. And I'm going to delete the cookies just for this website. So when you get the advice, you need to clear your cookies and close your browser. And it logs you out of every application you've ever used. Don't do that. Do this. Just clear the cookies for the site with the problem. Don't log yourself out of everything else on the internet ever. Um, so you can come here. You, uh, you can create cookies. You can edit your cookies. You can do what you like with your cookies. I've just deleted them all because it's a nice quick demo. When I refresh this page, I'm not logged in anymore. And that's because I lost my session cookie. So I log in. I give my session cookie. Well, like, oh, she's logged in. We store it in the session. Request comes in, it's got the cookie, good, we know who you are, we put your username in, we send it back. Once I delete that cookie, I'm not logged in anymore. So this can be quite helpful if you are testing with login and stuff, um, or if you do get into any kind of cookie-related problems. Okay. Back in the slide deck. So the tools I've just used, what header... Edit this cookie, two Chrome plugins, equivalents exist. And um, these slides are already online. I didn't link them from anywhere good, though, so you'll have to hunt really hard to find them or wait for me to tweet. All right, I'm Lorna Jane on Speaker Deck. You can find them now. Um, the open source project here is joined in. Um, not widely used in the Drupal community, massively widely used in the PHP community. Um, it's for giving public immediate feedback to speakers at events, in case you're wondering what you're looking at. OK. I use HTTP on a day-to-day -day basis. I am not a web developer. I've actually never really been a web developer. I'm allergic to pretty. So I've done quite a lot. Even when I was a PHP developer, I mostly did APIs. And now I'm a database developer. I mostly work with a tool called CouchDB, which has an HTTP web interface. So I tell you, this is not a talk about CouchDB, because I'm going to show you it in my demo. Let me just tell you, CouchDB has an HTTP interface. That is how you talk to it. You just make web requests. It's very restful, so there's get and put and post and delete. Um, it's an open source project. It's there. It's a document database. So it doesn't have rows and columns. It doesn't have a schema. You don't decide up front what shape your data should be. You just put things in collections. Um, and it speaks JSON over HTTP. Also has awesome replication in sync. Um, I went to a, a talk yesterday. Um, about the workflow initiative and when you start replicating between sites it'll use either this or an implementation of this protocol so CouchDB, interesting you'll probably hear it mentioned a few times so let me show you some of the way that I work with HTTP also in a pre-canned video press this, this and this there we go so you saw curl briefly earlier. I'm making a curl request to localhost. 5984 is the standard port for CouchDB. I make a get request. It talks back to me and says, hello, I am Couch. Um, there's a bunch of things that we can do with curl. Here, I'm just I'm creating a database. It's a put request. So I use dash x to specify the verb that I want to use. And I'm creating a products database. That exists now. I got an OK true. If I was inspecting the headers as well, you'd see a 201 created, because we made something. Sending the curl request, I can see a list of databases by hitting this endpoint. You see there's a couple of internal ones. There's my products DB that I just created showing up here. It's all very much on the command line. There's, you can do. Or everything you could ever imagine and some things that you will never need to imagine with, with Girl on the command line. Um, here I'm setting a header. That dash H is setting a header, just setting the content type, because I'm making a post request. I'm going to create 
an item in my products database. Um, so making a post request to the products database, writing some very short JSON, because this gets really bored, boring to watch me type. Thankfully, you're not watching me really type it. Again, we'd have got a 201 created. It creates the record. It gives me back um, just a JSON, uh, a JSON string there. CouchDB has an ID and a concept of revisions. So you'll see both of those everywhere when you're working with CouchDB. Now I've put a product into the database. I can again make a get request, which is the default to the products, and see that my doc count is one. It's like the second thing along there. It's not very pretty to read. So this, piping it to JQ, JQ is a command line tool for dealing with JSON. This is really helpful for all kinds of working with JSON, but I use it when tools give me back something that looks like that, because I would rather read it looking something like this. So if you are working with JSON on the command line, working with APIs, try, like, I think curl is a key skill. It's not the world's friendliest tool ever, but it's probably installed on your server, which is the big plus point. It's fairly ubiquitous. Um, but JQ is super cool for giving you back in a formatted, uh, readable, for a normal person sort of a way. I started using another tool recently called HTTP Console. This is just an NPM install. HTTP Console, put in your base URL, and then you can start just, it's a bit more of a humane syntax, making a GET request for that list of databases. And it shows you some of the headers and nicely formatted JSON data. The person recording this video is like happily still typing away and I'm still talking. Um, so getting all those DBs, this is the list of databases. I can set the content type and that gets stored as a header in HTTP console. It'll be used for all future requests. So you can just set it and it'll stick. This is cool because you can set like cookie values and stuff and it just sticks uh, and means it keeps on working. Dot headers shows I'm always sending accept star slash star. Um, I'm going to hit localhost and I'm going to send my content type application JSON. Creating a product, going to make a post request to products and then it stops to let me type my data. Again, I'm typing something really short here. Back, we've got a bag, I've got shoes. There's the response. So a little bit more humane to work with, I think, than curl. Everything you want to do in terms of verbs, um, headers, data, it's all here. It's a little bit more usable than curl. Uh, and I'm finding it really quite nice to work with, which is why I'm mentioning it to you here. There's the products collection, again, nicely formatted. Okay. This is Postman. This is how you make web requests for normal people. I am a command line nut, partly because I have some disabilities, so I find it difficult to use a mouse. Graphical tools are hard. So if you ask me to debug your API problem, I am going to use curl. For normal people, and I include you in that broad definition, um, I want you to try this tool, Postman. There's a bunch of options, so try loads of tools until you find one you like. But get to know your tools really well, because you probably mostly need them under pressure. So like, try and have a play on a rainy afternoon when you're not under pressure, and get the skills that you need. So this is Postman, and we're going to do the same thing again so that you can see it um, in all these different ways. So a get request to all DBs. Press send, get the JSON response back. A post request to create another product in the database. So we're posting into the products collection. I need to set the header uh, because I'm going to send some JSON content. The server doesn't understand me unless I say, this is JSON. Then it will JSON decode it. Couch only speaks JSON, so it could make assumptions, but it doesn't. Again, type, send, here it comes. Uh, and if you scroll down, you can just see that 201 created in the bottom right-hand corner. And again, I get that response back. So the point here isn't CouchDB at all, um, but trying to show you how the same operations look in a bunch of different tools. And it's for you to find something that works for, for your tool preferences. Quite a few of the IDEs have some of this sort of tool built in. 
Um, Postman is cross-platform. Use it wherever you like. It a, was a Chrome application originally, um, but also comes standalone now. Um, if you're on a Mac, try Pause. Like, cat, pause, pause. Um, that's supposed to be really good as well, so that can be um, an awesome tool to work with. Okay, where was I? So, links to all the tools. Obviously, I'm going to tweak the slides, so don't feel that you need to grab them all. Um, you saw Curl, first of all. Uh, it's been around forever and does everything. Um, HTTP console, I like it, um, and it's super easy to install with N NPM. I find it e a little bit easier to use. JQ is my JSON handling magic uh, tool. Yes, I'm get <laughs> getting some support from the second row here. JQ is awesome. Um, and if you, if, you have it, if you do work with Jason, you haven't found it, it's a real time saver. And then get Postman for the Postman tool, the more GUI approach. And the nice thing about Postman is you set it all up and you set your headers and your body and whatever, and you send the request, and then you can just make a few more changes and send it again. It's quite easy to just kind of edit. It also has, you didn't see it in the video because I tried to zoom up my font size as much as I could. I realized it's going to have a room this size, so I'm not sure how well that worked. Um, but it also has a sidebar that you can pop open with the history of what you've done. So if you do like a, how can I list, make a web request to an API endpoint that lists things and then you create some stuff, it's easy to go back and click on the request you made before and repeat that one and sort of see what's going on. So it is, it's very, very friendly, very usable. Okay, let's talk about authorization because I think this is quite a common, or I think it's really important. I also think it's something that you're likely to come up against that uses a bunch of the stuff that I've talked about today. So, we talked about HTTP being an envelope format. So the metadata is in the header and the real content is in the body. And what you'll often see is that the authorization, which is not really part of the product or content or whatever it is that we're transferring as the body of our request, the authorization is not really part of the content. So we shouldn't be making requests that send usernames and passwords anywhere other than in the header. So normally we'll do identification authorization in the header of HTTP. That's, that's typically considered to be good design. Even better than sending the username and password is to use a token. I have simply written tokens are ace. Um, they're ace because they're very flexible. So when you, cr we use a token instead of a username and password. So instead of supplying your credentials, we instead arrange for whichever app is doing the access to have a token. And that token, first of all, I can tell it's the token being used rather than actually you logging in. So we've already got this distinction between um, you personally and something on your behalf. It can also be restricted in some way. So, for example, we might only grant read-only access. The token might only be valid for a certain amount of time. It might not have access to everything. When you sign up for an access token with GitHub, you have to put which scopes you want. So if you're making like a super cool to-do list thing that uses gists as its storage, you can, and there's an app that does that, you can give the app access just to your gists, and they won't write all over your repos or manage your organization privileges or all the other things you can do off the app. So the tokens can be restricted in lots of different ways. They're very flexible. Crucially, they also mean that, let's say you download something um, onto your phone and it goes rogue and starts posting to GitHub or posting to your Twitter stream and there's no way of, it hasn't got a logout button and you uninstall the app and their server is still posting to your thing, you can go to GitHub and delete the token there. So the tokens are a really, it's a nice way. And if, if something happens, your token gets intercepted on the wire or something, just revoke it. You don't need to change your password and then, like my Twitter account is authorized against a bunch of different things. I have a lot of devices. I sign in with Twitter in a lot of places. I use tools like Buffer to schedule my tweets. Um, 
If, I, if it all used my username and password and I changed my password, it would take weeks to get everything logged back in again. Whereas with a token, you can just stop the one token from working and not affect everything else that's going on. For simple authorization, you may see basic or digest auth. And that is basically an authorization header with basic or digest and then some kind of hash. For basic, it's just username, colon, password, and it's base64 encoded. For digest, it's a bit more complicated, but not much. So you're basically sending content in the clear here. Be careful. And if you're going to use basic auth, probably use digest auth. Yeah. Um, a really common standard and particularly related to the tokens idea that I was just talking about is OAuth. Now, you may have used OAuth 1, hoping that not many of you have, was a bit of a pain. If you have, try and forget the experience completely. Um, OAuth 2 is way better. Um, OAuth is designed to kind of acknowledge the fact that we can do better than just having applications log in as you, which is how things used to work. So it acknowledges that there's a user, that's you. The provider, so something you already have an account with, maybe it's GitHub or Twitter, Facebook. Um, I think Drupal.org is also an OAuth provider. Somebody who writes a site that integrates with it be able to tell me. Anyway, so something that already has your data. And then there's a consumer, which is some kind of third party. So you're going to allow... Like, you want to use a GitHub client on your phone, so you're going to let that this, this third-party client have access to your GitHub account. So it really acknowledges three players in the relationship. Mm. Crucially important, before we proceed, you will do this over SSL. OAuth 1 was really hard to work with because it needed a PHP extension and it did encryption and there was a nonce and whatever else. Nonce for nonsense. Um, and fundamentally, it quite frequently didn't work and was really hard to debug. OAuth 2 just did away with all that nonsense security stuff that used to make it hard to use. And we just send credentials on the header, um, <laughs> which is great. But it means you must, must, must do OAuth over SSL um, because you are, you are literally sending an access token over the wire in the header. So, uh, but, you know, we have security, we have SSL, we've already invented this, let's encryptors come along. There are no excuses. So you will do it over SSL and you will even do it over SSL in, on, on your test and staging environments. I won't chase you down about your dev environments. OAuth has a bunch of different ways of doing what it calls grants. So a grant is like permission to get access, permission to get an access token. There's a bunch of ways you can do this. The most common way is the authorization code. And you have seen this. You go to a new website, you choose to sign in with Twitter. Right? So you click the sign in with Twitter button, you end up on Twitter, if necessary you log in, and it says, blah, 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 this app would like access to your account and it'll be read only or read write or read write and DM, I think are the Twitter levels. So you get information about what's going on and you either authorize or deny, right? If you authorize, you get forwarded back to where you came from. And what's actually happened, although you don't usually see it, is that a little authorization code has been sent back with you as you went back to the consumer's website. And that authorization code becomes the grant, the consumer that you are trying to, you, you're trying to log into using Twitter as an authentication source uses that to exchange for an access token. So that becomes the grant. Alternatively, you can have the implicit uh, grant where you go to... This is client-side applications because we can't hide anything on the server, right? It's already in the client. And the way that... This is less secure, but um, it, client-side implementations do it, and so it's appropriate in some, in some cases, where instead of sending you back an authorization code that gets exchanged for an access token, you just go and say yes, and you get forwarded back with the access token. Um, so it's visible. Another type of grant, and that's in my demo in a moment, is the password. Let's say 
well, the real example is the open source project that you've just seen. Joined in has an API. It also has the web front end that I showed you that I logged into and logged out of. And it talks to the API. I obviously, well, my team, I'm project maintainer, we built both of those. Right, when you log into our web front end, I can't send you to the API to agree for an access token. This makes no sense. So where there's a lot of trust between the thing providing the OAuth and the thing consuming the OAuth, you can do the password grant. And basically, people come to the website, they give their username and password, and that allows us to exchange for an access token. So they log in with their username and password. That's only if it's the same. Like, I wouldn't allow another consumer other than the project own website and own apps to use that grant. Everybody else has to do the authorization code and come in, send their users to our web front end, get them to confirm it, then they go back and get a code. Uh, there's also some situations where the client credentials, client credentials, you just give a client a hard-coded access token. And this will be something like your reporting tool or something like that, which is just, you just need some access. It's not really attached to a user usually. So with all these various ways of getting a grant type, we can log in and get an access token and then use that access token. This way, this way. I'm hoping that by the end of conference season, I've given 15 talks, I'll have worked out how my computer works. This button, this button. Here we are. Right. So here is a curl command that was too long-winded to type, so I just stuck it on the screen before I started the video. I'm making a post request because I'm creating something. <coughs> In this case, I'm creating a token. So I make a post request. It's got a content type header, application JSON, because I'm sending some body data. And I'm hitting the token endpoint, because I'm making a token, and I'm sending some data. And my data is the grant type password, the user's actual credentials, and the client ID and secret. This is test data. I just does not work on my live platform, seriously. Uh, someone asked me that the other day, and I was like, uh, no, this is, this, is not, this is not active on the live platform. It does work on the test platform. Uh, we, have, we, we scramble the database and inject some extra like, client registration so that all of our API tests work. Um, so I'm creating a new token. I'm using the password grant type, which means that I'm going to get an access token in response. Did I press go? Yes. There's the access token, and it also tells me which user I'm logged in as. So I grab that access token, and I can go ahead and use it, and I'm going to send it with every request. If I just make a request without it, it's not very readable. Hopefully I'm going to post it through JQ now. There we go. I make a request without it, I just get that list of links that you saw before. <coughs> if I go in and add it, uh, authorization, bearer, paste the access token, send the request. You can see that I get the extra metadata. So I'm logged in now. The access token means that I'm logged in. And it makes the API respond to me as a logged in user. So it can show me things like which are my talks, which events I'm going to, which people I'm friends with. So the data starts to respond to me in a way that's related to how I'm logged in. And you can see how what we've already done with talking about HTTP and talking about sending headers plays in here, sending that authorization header along the way. I can still use the access token as well in the browser. This is something that I use mod header for a lot. This API has, a, um, has the HTML renderer, and so I can just plug in my access token or plug in a cookie that I want to send and do it each time. Um, and you can see there, I've sent the access token, and it knows who I am. So the OAuth working with the access token um, is, I think, a nice use case of HTTP and something that I expect that you might come across as you integrate with third-party APIs in your own projects. Okay. Okay. 
I've said that. That's all fine. You can refer to it later. I'm going to wrap up a bit now, I think. Um, the HTTP, it's, it is the web. It's what the web is made of. It, it's the wiring that keeps, us all, keeps it all going together. As developers, understanding what's happening, understanding the requests and responses, having some idea of how the content negotiation would work, how to do authorization with the HTTP headers, how to work with it right down at that level, I think is the key skill. It's, it certainly stood me in good stead. Um, you can go a long way just refreshing in the browser and hoping for the best. But hopefully here I've shown you both some theory, um, some real examples, but also some hands-on tools that you can go back and try um, and that will help you to work with HTTP but also to debug it and to p potentially to develop some, some more some more advanced things than what you've already been doing, especially as we move to increasingly you know, headless um, API backend, something completely different on the front end, uh, WebSockets and Ajax, and, and understanding how to inspect all that transfer, I think is absolutely key. So the slides are there. They're not, actually, because I haven't created the link yet. Uh, the slides will be there, and I will tweet them very soon. Um, the feedback for DrupalCon is done directly through the schedule, so if you visit this talk now, you can say whether you liked any of it, none of it, some of it, some of it was useful, some of it could be better. All of your speakers massively appreciate this. Um, like, leave me some feedback, that'd be awesome. But all of your speakers have taken a lot of time to prep, and they massively, massively appreciate your feedback. It means a lot to them. So if you do have time um, or could make some time to do that, that would be awesome for everybody. I do have time for questions, so if you want questions, start wandering to the mic. Um, if you think of a question later or you don't want to stand in the middle of the room and use the mic, that's fine. You can get in touch with me. I am happy to communicate with you. Um, my next point is somewhat undermined by nobody getting up and running for the mic. <laughs> Which is also fine. I'm happy to not take questions. Um, that was really great. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks for spending time with me. So if you want to come, has any that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, so I have I have soft question. Good. So, um, how did you learn on this? Uh, mostly by breaking stuff. So, my strong points are very much in server side development. As an all round web developer, I'm okay right till the minute where it leaves the server. So, we're working in a team. By definition, you become expert in the stuff that you no one else really does. Um, then. Yeah, I guess I was just really interested in data transfer and APIs. It's so frustrating when the data exists on the internet, but you can't list it in a way you want. People put pictures of their opening hours, like a photograph of their opening hours times on their restaurant website, and there's no standard way of exchanging it. And that's just, it's inefficient and it's deeply annoying to me. Um, so that's kind of how I started getting involved in APIs. Um, the example that you've seen here, I built that. That's my open source project. I'm just stepping down as a maintainer now after six years. But seeing that grow and seeing lots of developers get some experience on that API and moving to a website and apps that use it, as well as seeing what people do with that data, particularly because it's all the PHP conference community data, um, it's... Really interesting, uh, Larry Garfield did a great one where he, there was some debate about how many new speakers there are at conferences, like what percentage of conferences are new speakers and what percentage is just the same people giving the same talk year after year after year. So he did some analysis pulling the data out of this API saying, well, when at this event, this speaker has no previous talk, so we're calling them a new speaker, um, and these speakers all have previous talks, so they're old speakers, and he did some analysis on that. 
That is not what I designed this data for. This data is for giving feedback to speakers so they can be accepted at conferences where we haven't seen them speak. But by making it available over an API, we were able to reuse the data, and he produced this. Uh, he produced this. Actually, a bunch of different sets of analysis where he had just made loads of requests to the API. Our rate limiting is a soft limit right now. <laughs> So that was fine. Uh, my sysadmin did ask me what happened to the server, and then um, I saw Larry's blog post, and I was like, that happened to the server. Um, so it's mostly about that. It's mostly about wanting to work with it um, and being a consultant and having to kind of make it up until it worked. Someone else is at the mic now. Hi. Hi. Technical question. Good. I've been messing around with uh, error messages and things recently. I've discovered that if... You've got a 404 situation, and you, I'm trying not to make this too Drupal focused, but if, you've, if your CMS is handling that and is sending back a nice message that says, oh, what a shame, we haven't got your page, and so on. If you also send a 404 header, then the browser may not show any of your nice page. It just hand, it shows its own error. Is that what you expect, and is that what should happen? Yeah, browsers are trying to help. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I use copy as curl, because sometimes the browsers will rewrite your headers in an attempt to fix something that they don't think should be happening, because they don't understand your use case. Um, this is a really good point, and it's a difficult one. The, the fail whale pages, where you do get a genuine page with a picture of a sad panda or something, um, normally come with a 200 OK status. And I think there's a difference between presenting a, oops, sorry, message to the user in a web context versus a 404 and potentially a, a more meaningful message in, a, in an API context. So yes, sending 404s to the browser will sometimes make the browsers do stuff, in which case send a 200 and present information the user can see. But if you're talking to a machine over HTTP, so it's an AJAX request or response, or um, you're talking to a mobile consumer or it's another API consumer, send the 404. And if you have more information, send that too. OK, thanks. No problem. I was just curious, um, CouchDB, how the data is stored? Because I think you said there weren't any rows or columns. Right. Um, uh, does it just come as a, a, a JSON string? or? Kind of. It looks like a JSON string. On the inside, it's actually way more flexible than that. You can do lots of <coughs> searching and optimizations and queries on way nested data. Um, if you've worked with MongoDB, it's like that, but better um, inside it. So it's stored in a sort of structured JSON representation machine format. To us, it comes and goes as JSON strings. So okay. we can work with it with our JSON tools. Um, but the internal storage is actually way more optimized than string. So it works as so you nest it within? Yeah, you just nest it. And I've seen it as a really nice implementation, for particularly for content. You've all had this experience, right? You have a page with this, a block of this has got and that, and then it's got some entity, and then you want to add a paragraph, and then you want to add a heading, and then you want to add an image. And then, like, that's not table-shaped. No, no. And you end up with all this like mad joins of different data types that know how to be edited and stuff. <laughs> with CouchDB, you just throw in another one, and if it's a different shape, that's fine. So every page would just be like a collection of stuff. Um, and then you go and edit the stuff. So I think it lends itself really well. I think you'll see more in this community of CouchDB. I fully expect to be back at DrupalCon actually talking about CouchDB next year because um, I think it's hot, and I'm really interested to see what happens with the replication stuff. I know people are using it in modules in their own projects. So having this is my third DrupalCon. I still haven't installed um, Drupal yet. Um, <laughs> I expect that to have changed. Um, by the time I come back, because your interests are starting to cross over with my tech interests way more. Um, so, yeah, but schemaless document database design, whole other talk, but really interesting topic. All right, thank you. My pleasure. <coughs> okay. Sorry, can I just go to the mic? Oh, yeah. I, I, um, I'm, just, I'm a designer, so like, I should know about all of this sort of stuff, but I haven't a clue about it, but I just wanted to say thanks, because I'm working on a an IoT project that's using a rubber button to update a Drupal database. 
and um, this is really helpful. This is what you timing. need. So yes, this is exactly what I need. Yes, I can go home now, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So the Internet of Things stuff. Yeah, again, it's all HTTP calls, and as we move to, you know, I am going to say this on stage: microservices. Okay, I'm done now. Um, <laughs> as we move to more and more kind of componentized things that talk to each other, little sensors that send us data. Um, there's a project in my home city to make smart gnomes. So they've got, they've taken garden gnomes apart and put sensors inside. We've got a, like a low bandwidth radio network and stuff. Right, those things phone home all the time. We have to be able to handle that, debug it, and yeah, present it in our web applications. So there's lots and that's a wonderful story. There's lots and lots of applications for this stuff, and I feel like I'm scratching the surface a little bit, but hopefully it's given you some tools that you can kind of go and ship something amazing and tell me some more interesting stories next time I see you. All right, I'm going to wrap it up there, but I'm here the rest of the day and most of tomorrow. Please, I don't know lots of people in this community, so feel free to stop me and talk to me. That would be marvellous. Thanks for sharing the time.